Well, I took a month off, but now I'm back to cover more science. And seeing as we're now less than a month away from the release of the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remake, why not cover a few of Generation 4's most iconic additions to the Pokedex? Hello everybody and welcome back to the Science Sub, where today we're in the Sinnoh region to take a look at the biological and zoological accuracies found in the start Pokemon for Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. But before we begin today's video, I'd just like to say that if you enjoy it, then please make sure to leave a like, subscribe and click the bell to keep up to date on the Science Sub and to see more of the real world science involved in your favourite game shows and more. But now, let's take a look at some Pokemon. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl is the fourth generation of Pokemon and it released for the Nintendo DS in 2006. This generation is set on the island of Sinnoh which is based on the Japanese island of Hokkaido. And like every other mainline Pokemon game, its story is relatively simple. Catch them all, beat the gyms, defeat the evil team and become the champion of the Sinnoh region. The main changes to the format of this game came from the touchscreen at the bottom of the DS system. And even then, it didn't add that much. The top screen was used for the main game and the bottom allowed you to use a new device called the Poketch. A Pokemon watch that allowed you to do such invigorating things as tell the time, count steps or the much more useful move tester which would allow you to see how effective an attack would be against an opponent's Pokemon dependent on their type. And the daycare tracker which let you see how many levels your Pokemon had gained since leaving them at the daycare in Salatian Town. But of course, for 99% of players, this shiny new watch wasn't the main draw for playing Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. That was the 107 new Pokemon that the generation added. So let's take a look at the first 9 and see what biological influences went into their designs and typing. When it comes to the Sinnoh starters, the Turtwig line may not be the fastest, with Turtwig having the lowest speed of any starter, as well as a critical weakness to ice thanks to its grass ground typing. And of course, this slow speed of the Turtwig line does make a lot of sense as they're based on Tortoise. In fact, the fastest Tortoise in the world is a real world record that was given to a Tortoise called Bertie in 2015. This Tortoise managed to walk as fast as 0.28 meters per second or 0.6 miles per hour, which is honestly pretty impressive for a Tortoise which will usually manage speeds as low as 0.1 meters per second. Similar to other grass type starters like Bulbasaur, Turtwig has a plant portion of its body that grows alongside its evolutions, starting out as a sprout during childhood and growing to a full tree by the time Turtwig evolves into Torterra. This is a great example of a mutualistic relationship, with Turtwig providing a tree with protection and nutrients through its shell which is made of soil. And in turn, the tree helps provide Torterra with camouflage, but Let's be honest, there are very few Pokemon that Torterra would have to hide from. But this can't happen in the real world, right? You don't just get plants sprouting on the backs of animals. Well, maybe not a true plant like a flower or a tree, but as we've covered in the show on the past, it is certainly possible for different types of life to sprout upon the bodies of animals. This has been shown in zombie ants back in our video on the science of Halo, where I took a look at the zombie ant fungus Audiocordyceps unilateralis, a fungi that burrows into carpenter ants heads and changes their behaviour to suit the fungi's needs. But today, we're not looking at anything so fancy. Instead, we're looking at the tortoise's aquatic counterparts, the turtle. In the wild, turtles will often have plant life growing on their shells, specifically different types of algae. This algae builds up on the tortoise's carapace, or upper shell, and we can see a bit of this on Torterra, who seems to have algae growing on the spines of its shell, as well as the tree that comes off its back. As to what kind of species of tortoise Torterra is similar to, we need to look to the US, specifically to the rivers and lakes of the southeastern states to find the alligator snapping turtle, which like Torterra, has a shell that is covered in spines, and more importantly is often covered in algae. Okay, so from here we move from something that's pretty feasible to something that's, well, not. Chimchar, Monferno and Infernape are the fire starters of the Sinnoh region and obviously they're based on primates, with Chimchar resembling a young chimpanzee as seen in its lacking proper tail, Monferno resembling a golden snub-nosed monkey with a little tuft on its head similar to that of the mandrill, but what about Infernape? Well, Infernape's origins are a bit less biological and a bit more mythological. Now this is not to say that Infernape is not based on a primate, but it's a very specific one. Sun Wukong from the Chinese epic Journey to the West. 
In fact, Infernix's design involves a fiery head, which could resemble Sun Wukong's Phoenix Feather Cap. As well as that, Infernix's long white areas on its legs could allude to Sun Wukong's cloud walking boots. Infernape is also covered in gold, which could allude to Sun Wukong's designs generally having some kind of gold armour or bands. But what does this have to do with fire? Well, Sun Wukong was supposedly able to control the winds, fire and water, and once spent 49 days inside Lao Chi's furnace with standing as Sam D fire, but there must be more links between primates and fire than that. Another possible link between Infernape and fire could be the monkey-like humanoids called Vanara, which come from the Hindu epic Ramayana. This features the Hindu god Hanuman, a Vanara who was granted immunity from fire and even had his tail lit on fire by the demon followers of the Lanka king Ravana. This story is even considered by some scholars to be the origin for Sun Wukong from Journey to the West. Finally, we're going to take a look at the Piplup line, which surprise surprise is based on a penguin. Yeah, to be honest, Generation 4 starters might be the easiest to compare to real world animals. Piplup, Primplup and Empoleon being based on penguins are naturally fits for the water typing, with Piplup resembling the chicks of the Emperor Penguin, with white areas on its face surrounding its beak. And even its Pokedex entry supports this, with the black and white Pokedex entries for Piplup stating, Piplup, the penguin Pokemon. Although not the most sure-footed, it is proud nonetheless, getting right back up after a fall with head held high. And this makes sense for Piplup, as it would only be a chick and less able to walk or tend to wobble on icy terrain. Especially that its feet do seem to be quite small compared to its body, a trait similarly shared with the chicks of Emperor Penguins. But whilst Piplup and Empoleon do share traits with Emperor Penguins, Primplup diverges from this, with a look that seems to be more based on a species of crested penguins. These penguins have long golden hairs, very similar to the spikes on either side of Primplup's head. However, when it comes to personalities, these two penguins can be more different. Every single Pokedex entry outside of Pokemon Pearl states for Priplup that it lives alone. And this is apparently because they all believe themselves to be the most important. This is very unlike most species of penguin, which will often move around in large groups. But there are certain species that go against this trend. The yellow-eyed penguin of New Zealand doesn't tend to go into crowded colonies and will instead prefer to go hiking on their own. And this just leaves us with Empoleon, which is pretty obviously based on an emperor penguin. But in terms of its design, it's anything but, with Empoleon being more of a generic penguin rather than looking like any specific species. In fact, it's weird how much Piplup looks more like an emperor penguin chick than Empoleon looks like an actual emperor penguin. But of course, as of Pokemon Sword and Shield, another penguin Pokemon has come into existence, Ice Cube, which looks like a regular old penguin, but with an ice cube on its head, hence the name. And in all honesty, the look of this little penguin does appear to be most realistic, even when comparing it to the Piplup line, at least when looking below the neck. So there we go. It turns out that the Piplup line is pretty damn close to its real world influence. And although Chimchar's final evolution is much more related to mythology than zoology, it is still fascinating to look through the Chimchar line and see those smaller, more subtle biological accuracies. And as for Turtwig, well, he's probably in the middle somewhere, with the biggest limitation being that you wouldn't tend to find a tree on the back of a tortoise. But of course, that's only the starters for Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. And there is another Pokemon game coming out soon, with Pokemon Legends Arceus coming out at the beginning of next year. So who knows, I might go over its starters, Rowlet, Cyndaquil and Oshawott in the future to see how their evolutionary lines compare to Owls, Badgers and Sea Otters. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help fight the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, make sure to share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any scientific subject or topic that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science sub videos and join my Discord for chats about science, gaming and more. But until then, this has been the Science of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for more game based content then you can join me over on Twitch, where I livestream 3 times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further, then you could contribute to my Patreon, where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.